sometimes training doesn't have to be perfect in, in terms of studies, textbook, whatever. Sometimes training is just fun. You just do stupid stuff. You challenge each other. There's the mental toughness aspect to it. What is up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Renegade Radio. I am Jay Ferrugia, here to help you unleash your strongest self. Now, you may have noticed on the last episode, I inadvertently, unintentionally said Renegade Radio instead of the Renegade Strength Show, and I just took it as a sign from the universe to go back because I have been through uh, a lot the last few years, and I'm back home now in Cali. Things are dramatically different. I feel exponentially better, different, more confident, happier than I have in the last three years. And so I just thought, wow, what a what a crazy coincidence. Uh, Maybe that's a sign. So I'm trying to rewind. You know, you you can't go backwards in life, but it's not necessarily going backwards. It's looking at what worked, what didn't work, assessing, moving on. And so here we are, Renegade Radio. I don't know if it's the right move, the wrong move. It just feels right. Uh, the best years, the best 10 and a half years of my life were here in California. It's where I journeyed to reinvent myself, to uh, rewrite false narratives that I had in my head, to change all the self-limiting beliefs, change everything about myself, to be, you know, to go from the least confident person on the planet to uh, one of the most confident people on the planet, to someone who had no friends and was not connected, to the super connector, the man who is known as the most well-connected person, the man who was known as the mayor of L.A., um, and I walk up and down the streets of Santa Monica and I know everybody. People who have lived here 10, 20 years young, longer than me say, how do you know everybody? And so, you know, my life here was like a movie. My life here was like a fantasy camp. And in the last three years, and a lot of people went through dramatic changes and struggles the last three years. And um, But I'm going to share some more of those with you guys in the very near future. But anyway, today we are going to do a quick, uh, short little Q&A episode and then... We will go from there. So uh, somebody asked, did you move back to Cali or are you just visiting? For now, I am just visiting. Like I said, it's my favorite place in the world. I love it. Uh, There's nowhere I'd rather be. It's where the majority of my tribe is. The the majority of my friends are here. I mean, I have a lot of close friends other places, but the largest conglomerate of conglomerate, conglomerate, hard word to say, uh, all those people is right here. So countless friends here. When I moved to LA, I knew one person. Now, if I took out my phone and scrolled through and showed you the numbers of everyone that I uh, have here in LA, it's in the hundreds. It's crazy. I've shown it to people and it blows their mind. Um, So, and and, and I also associate uh, Southern Cali, LA, Santa Monica with not only, like I said, the best years of my life, but where I changed so much about myself. I became a completely different person. I became the person that I would admire, that I'd want to be. I I looked at all the qualities of the person that I'd want to be. I looked at what would I want someone to say about me at my eulogy. And I worked on developing all those characteristics and becoming that person, that person who is the inspiration for everyone around them. And so that's what I associate Southern California with all these memories, this, 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 this fantasy camp, this movie. And so now that's why I'm back here. And we are looking, uh, we're, we're hanging out for a, a month or two, and then, you know, we're looking, we're deciding where we want to be. Uh, we don't want to be in Miami, so, you know, that's that's where we're at right now. And, um, and you know, I, again, I associate, like, my business growing 4 or 5x from what it was. Uh, some of my favorite things in life, surfing, uh, hiking, uh, doing improv. Doing improv and surfing was brand new to me when I got to California, uh, however many years ago, ago it was now, 13, 14 years ago. And that became two life-changing things for me, two of my favorite things that I do. So here temporarily, uh, maybe coming back permanently. And then some people will say, well, what about the state of the world? What about shutdowns? What about mandates? What about masks? What about all these things? Definitely a legitimate concern, something that I am not going to stress out about, not going to worry about. Of course, it's got to be in the back of your mind. You got to be prepared. But, um, you know, if all that does happen, would I rather be somewhere else with without my crew or would I rather be here? I'd probably rather be here with my crew and then just say, hey, guys, uh, we can't go out. We can't do things. Everyone's coming here. And then just break it up, right? Like one day we're at Bedros's house. One day we're at Sean's house. I don't know. We'll figure it out as we go. But that is the uh, that is the plan. That's where we're at. And that's where we're going. Uh, this question says, I lift three days per week. Is 10K steps per day enough for cardio? 
uh, for fat loss if diet is in check. Now, that really depends upon the person. It could be enough for fat loss. You know, for me, when I turned 40, I wanted to get a six-pack, a visible six-pack for the first time in my life. I had gone from uh, the height I am now, uh, six feet tall, 147 pounds when I graduated high school. I ate and trained my way up to 230 pounds, and then I dieted myself down. Uh, went, again, when I turned 40, I wanted to have that visible six-pack, and I got down into the 180s, you know, 187, 188 to 190, and that's what I've kind of just floated around at since then for the last nine years where I'm comfortable, my, my joints feel better, uh, I like being lean, I'm healthier, I feel, I feel exponentially better, I have more energy. Now, when I did that, I didn't do cardio. I would hike, I would uh, walk 10,000 steps a day, which is your question, and I would run sprints once a week. The main, and, and my, my training was not circuit training, it was not any of that uh, stuff that I don't like, any of the, you know, the the, the circuits and the, the fat loss training, the, the Metcons, things like that. It was all heavy strength training and a 6 to 12 rep, rep, 6 to 12 rep range. A, uh, a lot of big compound exercises, taking near failure, long rest periods, two to three minutes rest. So you don't have to do anything extreme like that for uh, fat loss. It's simply diet. And then what else do we have to have in check? We have to have your sleep in check. We have to have your stress management in check. We have to have other lifestyle factors in check. And then if, you're, you know, if your diet's on point, all those other things are on point and you are, you know, you're training properly, you're getting the proper rest and recovery, you don't need it. You don't need anything more than those 10,000 steps a day. Now, does that cover your cardiovascular health, your cardiovascular needs? No, not, not at all. If you're just lifting with long rest periods and you're just walking 10,000 steps, but you're not doing anything in a zone two, you're not doing any high-intensity stuff, that's not the best plan longe for longevity either. So for cardiovascular benefits and long-term health, you know, uh, cognitive function, immune function, recovery, all these things, you should still be doing cardio. I like that, you know, zone one stuff is probably, most for most people, that's probably going to be walking at a fast pace, and that would be your 10,000 steps. But zone two, you're going to need to get up over 120 beats per minute, depending on your age. You might be in that 130-ish range. So that you're going to have to get on some kind of cardio machine, unless you're hiking. Um, you're going to have to do some kind of cardio machine, a rower, a bike, a stair climber, uh, whatever, things like that, ski erg, um, and then high intensity stuff, which I like about 10 to 12, maybe 15 seconds of really high intensity stuff. And then that, that workout can last and then longer rest periods, right? So 60 seconds, 90 seconds, two, three minutes sometimes. Um, you know, if you look at sprinters, right, they're the lean, they're lean and they're muscular. They run a, a, a five to 10 second sprint, let's say and they'll rest five minutes. Now, I don't expect the average person to be resting five minutes, but you don't want to be just turning it into this crazy interval thing or, uh, you know, where you're just burning yourself out. One of my favorite quotes about training is from uh, Pavel Tatsalin, and he said, what is the biological cost of your training? So we're always looking at how is the training impacting your joints, your immune system, your sleep, your mood, your gut health even. You know, if you're overtraining, that can negatively impact your digestion, your gut health. So I like to and, – and, and just cause excess fatigue, right? So I'm always looking at how do we improve your overall health? How does training lend itself to longevity instead of just beating the shit out of yourself? And how do we train in such a way that we're minimizing that fatigue so you have more energy, you have less inflammation, you always feel better? Um Next question is, and this kind of ties into it, right? This is basically what I was saying there is, what do you think about ladders, AMRAPs, which is as many reps as possible or as many rounds as possible? Uh, what do you think about ladders, AMRAPs, and Metcons? I don't like them generally. I like uh, ladders for improving something like chin-ups. Now, ladder is basically, uh, I'll show you kind of just quickly illustrate how that would work. You would do one rep. Okay. Well, let, let me actually do this. So you'd basically take, let's say you can only do six chin ups. So you take half that number. So you can do three, right? If you could do 10, your number is five, but let's say you can only do six chin ups. You're struggling and believe it or not, most adults can't even do six chin ups. So you can do six right now. And we want to increase that to 12. The way you do a ladder is you do one rep and then rest about as long as it takes your imaginary partner or your partner to do his one rep his or her one rep. Then you do two reps. Your partner goes, your imaginary partner goes, they do two reps. Now you do three reps. Then you rest 
and you go back to one, right? So it's one, two, three, one, two, three. I would generally start someone the first day because ladders you want to do frequently. So you'd be doing them three to four days a week. So the first day I would just do those, those two ladders, right? Meaning one, two, three, one, two, three. Next time, let's say you do that on Monday. Wednesday, I would add another, I might add another ladder. It kind of depends on the person. You might just add one rung. So we go one, two, three, one. Uh, might add two, or might add just a full kind of climb back up that ladder, right? So one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Friday, a- add more to the ladder. And then so over time, you can do this for about four weeks. Generally, I like it for about four weeks. You add rungs to the ladder. And you continually build up, build up, build up, then take about a week off of doing chin ups and then test your max. And you will almost 100 times out of 100, you will have increased, um, if not by a small amount, you will have dramatically increased the amount of chin ups you, you did. So you might go from six to nine, you might go from six to 12, you might double it. Uh, so ladders are very effective and it's a great way to kind of grease the groove and train strength without burning out. So let's look at as many reps as possible. That I don't mind. Now, higher reps do contribute to a little bit more central fatigue. So you might just, you know, have generally more fatigue overall throughout the week. I don't really like uh, a lot of sets above 15. 15 and under is going to be better. Even that 6 to 10 range is going to be better at mitigating fatigue. But, you know, once in a while for certain muscle groups... Uh, quads definitely tend to do better sometimes with just higher reps. And you can say, well, there's no studies that prove that, but I always go to real world evidence. What have people done in the real world? What, uh, really good experienced coaches have produced results. And a lot of those people agree that there are some muscles, some exercises that are better for high reps, you know, in my opinion. And, uh, I don't think anyone smart with experience would disagree with me. A leg press is not a good exercise to do, if, especially if you're strong, to do five reps on. If you're strong, that might be a 12 to 20 rep exercise. Um, and now that, that is going to cause some fatigue, so you don't want to do maybe one hard set of that, right? But, th- you know, that's my take on the – here's the other thing too. Sometimes training doesn't have to be perfect – in, in terms of studies, textbook, whatever. Sometimes training is just fun. You just do stupid stuff. You challenge each other. There's the mental toughness aspect to it. And so that's that's when things like that are, are great, right? You do a workout that's smart on paper. You've done lower reps, straight sets, progressive overload. You minimized fatigue. And now we are looking at Hey, let's just do some stupid shit, right? Let's just challenge each other. Let's take uh, X amount of our body weight on this exercise and do one set as many reps as possible. That's great. That's fun. Done it plenty of times. Does it burn you out? Maybe, yeah, but but training's got to be fun too, right? Like everything can't be perfect on paper, like I said. Um, and so, so that's my take on that. Just don't overuse it. Don't do it too much. As far as as many rounds as possible, that's more of a crossfit thing. That I don't like at all because what, what that implies is you're, you're racing against the clock. So anytime we're doing something technical, and I believe all strength training exercises, even something like a curl or a lateral raise is technical if you really want to have mastery and do it correctly. So not something you want to be mindlessly rushing through. Shorter rest periods cause more fatigue. Shorter rest periods aren't as good for muscle growth. So we have a bunch of red X's there of things that we don't want to do, things we want to avoid, because uh, it's just not conducive to to good, smart training, to hypertrophy, to strength gains, and to, uh, again, technical mastery of any kind of lift or exercise. So I don't like as many rounds as possible. Uh, and, and you'll get sloppy, and you'll get injured. And you're doing, uh, you know, generally when you're doing an AMRAP, uh, there's some technical lifts thrown in there, like an Olympic lift, a barbell squat or deadlift or something. And that's the last thing you want to do uh, under fatigue, breathing heavily. So I don't like that. And was it AMRAPs? Oh, Metcons, I, I definitely don't like. Um, I think that's not a good option. I like low-intensity cardio. I like high-intensity cardio. I don't like Metcons where you do circuit training and things like Orange Theory and CrossFit. I think that just leads to injuries and burnout for too many people. So not a big fan of that. Uh, what programming changes would you make if you were training athletes? Now, for those who don't know, for those who may have just heard about me in the last few years, I trained athletes. I trained countless, countless athletes for the first 15 years of my career, high school, college, 
professional athletes. Uh, a lot of teams have brought me in to consult to work with them. So I have quite a bit of experience there. You you may have only found out about me maybe through the hard gainer column men's fitness, which honestly that's years ago now too. Um or just in recent years where I focus more on training guys who, you know, are over 30 or 40 who might be a little bit more beat up, you know, your executive, things like that. But I really cut my teeth training athletes. I, I started training regular people because you can't just jump in as, a, as an inexperienced personal trainer and train athletes. But that was my dream. And I always wished that, man, I wish I started training when I was younger and knew what the fuck I was doing because I could have been a better athlete which would have been awesome. But if I couldn't, at least I could help all these kids and later these adults become better athletes, uh, you know, in their chosen sport. So I was training adults, you know, getting up, training adults five, six, seven, eight, nine in the morning. And then eventually uh, I met, my dad was friends with somebody uh, named Stan Schwab, actually. And and Stan had a, had a son named Mike, who Mike is now in his 40s. To this day, I started training Mike when he was 12 years old. So many, 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 many years ago. To this day, Mike is a good friend and like a little brother to me still. And uh, so Mike came in. He was a great wrestler. He was a great football player. Uh, if I remember correctly, he may have set a rushing record at his high school. Um, went on to play college ball where I trained him. He referred me other people. And so that was kind of, you know, my first foray in the training athletes was with Mike, and he was the first of hundreds and hundreds of athletes that I trained over the years. Uh, he, refer, You know, the first couple of people he, ref, he referred me, I remember the beginning, it was Mike, his good buddy Chris Carey, who I still know to this day, and uh, a kid named Joey Vespucci. Those were, were, were the first three, and that was also how I kind of invented group training because I was training them one-on-one -on -one the same way I was training the adults, and then they just asked, can we can we train together? So I brought those guys in. I started training Chris and Mike together because they were best friends. Joey said, can I jump in in this group? And that was, uh, again, how I kind of just stumbled my way into inventing group training as we know it to this day. There was no such thing as group training. There was only you could go to the gym by yourself. You could go to, to Bally's or Gold's or World Gym or Powerhouse or whatever it might have been. And basically in those days it was you know just training with machines and whatnot. Um, or you could go to a class like Lucille Roberts or, you know, some kind of aerobics class or something like that. There was no strength training groups. There was no strength training classes like CrossFit, anything like that. So I was one of the first people I knew of to do that. That's why I always claim that I invented, uh, group training. Um, maybe someone else was doing it in another part of the world. I don't know. Nobody that had ever that I had ever heard of was doing it. And so I taught that model to countless fitness pros that you know by name to this day. They were all doing one-on-one. -on -one. I said, hey, man, why don't you get three kids together? Why don't you get four kids together? Why don't you get six kids together? And then eventually grew to eight, 10, 12 in a group. And, you know, eventually I hired people. But anyway, so, so that was that. And then how would I change any of my recent programs that have come out over the last few years? How would I change those if it were for an athlete? If you're an athlete, you always want to be doing some kind of jump, plyo. You know, you want to be throwing something. So a lot of variety of med ball throws in a variety of directions. Um, you want to be doing some dynamic effort stuff, some some explosive power stuff, right? So, you know, that could be as simple as box jumps. You want to be running some short distance sprints, some change of direction stuff, uh, plyo push ups, and then. Uh, variations of Olympic lifts based on your sport, your anatomy, what you can do. So so maybe uh, if it's a football player, he has to do cleans because he's getting tested in the barbell clean. Maybe he's just doing high pulls or shrug pulls. Maybe if he's not getting tested in those, he does something a little bit more joint friendly like a one-arm snatch with a dumbbell, uh, a one-arm clean and press, something like that, uh, a dumbbell push press. Uh, again, I, I mentioned a plyo push-up. Uh, squat jumps. There's, there's a lot of things like that you can do, and then again, s you know, specific to your sport, we would add in stuff specific to your sport. Not not too sport specific, where you start really closely mimicking sporting actions with a load, because that actually uh, screws you up. You know, like I mean, loading up something on a cable and mimicking your baseball swing. I think that's a bad idea. That screws you up. But um, all the things I mentioned there, 
I would add in more loaded carries. I would add in uh, a wider variety and probably more volume of direct core midsection work, making sure you're getting your obliques, your training rotation. We don't necessarily always train rotation in every program with your 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 basic executive, your adult, but training rotation is super important. Rotation, anti-rotation, flexion, anti-flexion, uh, extension, anti-extension, th- you know, things like that. Uh, become very important for athletes. Single single leg stuff. I, I include that in the training of anybody. So I think that's you know always going to be in, in the programs I write. Um, and then you know it's even more important to minimize fatigue, central fatigue when when you're dealing with an athlete who maybe is practicing a few days a week, maybe is playing a few days a week, whatever it might be. Now we might want to bring down the volume even lower. We're we're not going to do any kind of am wraps or any of the kind of stuff that's going to burn you out, the, the high reps, the low rest periods, things like that. We really want to minimize fatigue for the athlete because he has to be fresh when he steps on the court or the field or in the ring, whatever it might be. So, you know, those are just some things that they may actually be doing less volume and maybe even only training three days a week versus your executive guy who may be doing slightly more volume. Maybe he can handle four or five days a week if everything's in check, whereas the athlete has other concerns and they want to be freshest and they want to be most recovered when they step onto their, uh, uh, again, onto their court, their field, whatever it might be. So those are the main differences that I would make. And then, of course, you know, the – Every sport has its injury concerns, right? So you might you might have someone who's who's serving or or pitching or something like that. They might be doing a little bit more uh, external rotator work. You have a combat athlete; they're going to be doing a little bit more direct neck work, um, and then just bulletproofing certain areas. We would we would obviously want to look at ankles. We want to look at knees, hips, elbows. Uh, combat athlete, you know, if they're you know be getting getting armbarred and whatnot, we're going to look at how we can bulletproof elbows, shoulders, things like that. So overall, the the programming for any athlete and any person is going to be similar in that you should always do some kind of jump, some kind of carries, um, push, pull. Not necessarily does does everyone have to overhead push and pull. Some people just shoulder wise and thoracic mobility wise can't do it, but everyone can push and pull. You know this way, meaning meaning some kind of chest dumbbell press, push up, whatever. And anyone can anyone can and should do a lot of rows. Uh, overhead stuff, not not a requirement for for everyone, especially if they can't do it. And then squat, lunge, single leg squat, uh, hinge, and um, uh, you know uh, I, I think that about covers it. So let's see what else we got here. Is CrossFit dumb for a 42 year old? Uh, I feel like we've kind of covered this a bit already, and my answer is yes, that it is not what I would recommend. It is the opposite of what I rec- recommend. So I recommend longer lower, longer rest periods. CrossFit has short rest periods. I recommend lower reps. CrossFit generally has higher reps. Now, some sometimes you wor- you'll work up to heavy sets and one RMs, three arms, whatever. Um, I don't feel like there's a lot of balance in the CrossFit workouts that I see. If I look at the wads and things like that, I feel like there's a – there's a, a little too much quad work. There's not enough upper back uh, rowing, pulling, things like that. There's not enough hamstring work, not enough glute work. Uh, you see a lot a lot, a lot of the CrossFitters, especially a lot of CrossFit females, they have really overly developed quads and their hamstrings lack a little bit. Sometimes glute development is lagging behind a little bit. Um, so, so, so just from a balance and an injury perspective, I think there's some things we could do to to improve that and not everyone should be or or can do those exercises you know not everyone should be uh doing olympic lifts not everyone should be doing barbell deadlifts and barbell squats and barbell presses uh those exercises are very technical you have to have the right anatomy the right structure for them so so that they feel good um and and that's where i think that that it's hard to say what my biggest issue is is it the exercise selection is it the execution is it the fact that we're doing it um under cardiovascular debt, we're doing it with low rest periods. I mean, it's really a combination of all those things. But I think, you know, as, as I mentioned the previous answer, everyone should press and, and, and pull and squat and hinge and lunge and carry 
but not everyone has to do the same versions of those exercises. So not everyone has to barbell back or front squat. Not everyone has to overhead press with a barbell or bench press with a barbell. Not everyone has to deadlift with a barbell. Uh, we can do variations of those, right? So some people might only be able to do a dumbbell uh, chest press or a, a push-up or even a good machine press, and that feels great for them. A barbell, a barbell feels awful for them, and it puts a lot of stress on their wrists and their elbows. So they're going to feel much better doing one of those one of those options I just gave there. Um, squatting, everyone should be able to squat, but some people may just do body weight squats or goblet squats, and more of their loading is going to come from uh, split squats, walking lunges, reverse lunges. Uh, Cossack squats, things like that, or you get them on a good machine that really feels good for them, fits their structure, fits their anatomy. Now maybe we have them on a pendulum squat or a hack squat. So it's it's the idea that you want to uh, you want to squat, you want to press, you want to pull. In terms of hinging, not everyone needs to do a straight bar deadlift from the floor. Maybe they're going to do a trap bar. Maybe they're going to do a trap bar RDL. Maybe they're going to do a barbell RDL. Maybe they're going to do a dumbbell RDL. A single leg RDL with the the weight. In the opposite hand, a single leg RDL with the weight in the same hand, a single leg RDL with uh, support. So you're holding on to something. And again, with the weight in either hand, uh, you could be doing a 45 degree back raise. Even even a, a hip thrust or a glute bridge is a version of a hinge. So there's so many exercises that fit the major movement patterns, but we don't need to just say, okay, you could only do these barbell exercises because whatever, it's primal, it's old school, whatever. There's 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 better tools for certain people. Uh, and then and then again, just to, to reiterate, I think there's a lot of imbalances in in CrossFit programming which we could dramatically improve. I also don't think there's enough of a focus on low intensity cardio either. And there's probably not enough accessory work, meaning direct buys, direct tries, direct calves, direct shoulder work sometimes. Uh, and, and for an athlete, same thing I just mentioned earlier, maybe we're doing some direct neck work if it's a combat athlete, a football player, whatever it might be. Uh, how long are you shutting down screens before bed? Do no screens apply to TV also? Uh, two hours before bed is ideal to not have screens, not even have bright light, bright uh, lights above you. That can cause disruption in your sleep and your circadian, circadian rhythm. So what I would do is at night, turn the brightness on your phone down as low as it can go. Turn the brightness down on your TV as low as it can go. I get that most people will not... Uh, turn off the TV and just sit there and stare at the wall under candlelight for two hours before bed. Uh, ideally, you'd read a book, but if that's not going to happen and you're going to watch TV, just make sure, you know, and, and I, I'd say almost every smart TV nowadays has the option where you can turn the brightness all the way down, turn the backlight all the way down. So just bright enough that you could barely see it. That's going to be ideal. That's what I would say, you know, being realistic. Again, I know most people will not completely turn off the TV, so just do that and avoid the bright lights overhead. So you you could do all the things that I just mentioned there, but you walk into the bathroom right before bed to brush your teeth and you have that bright over, overhead light, that's going to actually screw up your sleep. So be conscious of that. If I go into the kitchen for some water, make sure I just have the dimmer on or have maybe one of those little backlights on or I have candles uh, in the bathroom, same thing. Maybe just have the little night light on there. You have a, a light out in the hallway that's kind of shining in there, and it's it's a light. You just want – you barely want to see your way around at night, right? You want really dim light. So be conscious of that bright overhead light. And then if you wake up in the middle of the night, let's say you wake up 2, 3 in the morning to go pee, you don't want to walk into the bathroom and hit that, hit that bright overhead light because that's going to disrupt your sleep. So figure out, you know, you got to have a night light in there or a candle in there or something like that. Just be hyper-conscious, hyper-aware. And I'm not someone who likes to get OCD with all the biohacking stuff. I'm not going to be wearing these glasses and obsessing about all this kind of stuff and spending thousands on, on crazy stuff like that. And I don't think you should either. It becomes uh, almost neurotic. But I think that's a good thing. It's, it's very simple. You don't have to buy a million things and wear all these glasses and hazmat suits and all the craziness. Uh, you just be aware of bright light at night. All right. Training advice that you would give to your 25-year-old self. I would say a few things. One, listen to your body. I was beat up a lot back in those days because 52 weeks a year, I was trying to max out. I was going heavyweight. There was a stretch where I was really into powerlifting, influenced by Louis Simmons and Westside. And so, you know, I'm putting a minimum of 315 on my back, 
A lot of a lot of weeks, 405, 425, 455, 52 weeks a year, hitting a one rep max. And I'm doing that with some kind of variation of a deadlift. And I'm doing that with some variation of a bench press, whether it's a bench press, a low incline press, a steep incline press, a a one board, a two board, a three board, a four board press, whatever. Uh, presses off chains. I'm maxing out all the time and hitting that one to three rep max. And it didn't matter how I felt. If I got in there and my shoulder was a little tweaky, we would just get this blue heat, which is horse liniment, and you'd rub it on your shoulder and f- until it felt like your shoulder was on fire and was going to melt. And then all of a sudden you couldn't feel it anymore. And maybe you're a little bit tired. So you're tired, you're in pain. So you hit some, we, we had, we literally had smelling salts in the gym. We hit the smelling salts. And again, this is when, when I'm, you know, walking around at 230, fairly strong, pretty big, bloated. And, uh, and it just, did not matter how you felt. You're going in and you're pushing. You're trying for that max. And and that was on every exercise I would do that, right? So I would listen to my body. On those days, I would say, okay, let's back off. Let's go lighter. Let's do a different exercise. Let's not get hurt. Let's live to train another day. So really just listening to your body. And then days, if you're completely wiped out, you got one of two choices. You move the workout uh, back a day. Or you simply go in and just dial back the intensity. Maybe you you would dial back the volume a little bit. Uh, those would be you know some of the smartest things to do. I just simply didn't do that. Uh, the next thing I would do would be better exercise selection, which I essentially answered in the last question. Not necessarily being married to certain barbell lifts or any lift that was on a top five or top 10 exercises or exercises that you have to do list. There are no exercises that you have to do. Everybody should do, again, the basic movement patterns and variations of them. But the best exercise for me might not be the best exercise for you or for you. It just really depends on your structure and what feels good. And so I would have better exercise selection. I would have better exercise form, technique, execution, whatever you want to call it. Back in those days, it was all about just beating records, setting you know new PRs, getting the fucking weight up at all costs. Where nowadays, I'm much smarter about it. And so I want my form to be optimized first and foremost. And I always tell people, it doesn't matter what age you are. People say, oh, I'll, uh, I'll adhere to your training principles and adopt, adopt your training principles when I'm over 35 or when I'm over 40. I'm like, no, no, no. Those are training principles for everybody. I would do that if if you were 18 right now, that's how I would train you. So the first form of progressive overload is better technique. So before we put more weight on the bar or before you try to do more reps with the same weight, we would maximize your ability to do that uh, exercise optimally. Just optimize your technique, better form, first form of progression and progressive overload. And then slowly over time, your body adapts, your muscles get stronger, your tendons and ligaments get stronger, then the weight just naturally goes up over time. Too many people rush to add weight to the bar or add reps where your body really doesn't adapt that fast. There's a great book, uh, um, I'm drawing a blank on it, but uh, uh, Building the Gymnastics Body, I believe it's called, by Christopher Sommer, and he talks about in there how he won't let you advance from one progression to the next for somewhere between six and eight weeks, which is a really foreign concept to most of us where we go in and we say, okay, if I did 100 pounds for eight reps last week, I have to do 100 pounds for nine reps or it's a failure. No, what it is is a recipe for disaster and a recipe for injury and joint pain. Um, So you wouldn't, there's no other physical endeavor where you'd go into the gym uh, on a regular basis. Like if you, if you shoot 10 free throws and right now you make six out of 10, you wouldn't expect tomorrow to shoot, to get seven out of 10. The next day, get eight out of 10. The next day, get nine out of 10. The next day, get 10 out of 10. And now you're perfect, right? Or if you played golf today and shot a 120, you're not going to shoot a 110 next time and a, and, a, and a 100 the following time and a 90 and an 80 and seven. We don't make linear progression, but yet we try to make linear progression. We chase linear progression with strength training, weightlifting, bodybuilding, whatever you want to call it. And that, again, is always a recipe for getting hurt, for having nagging aches and pains, for getting injured. So the the weight eventually does have to go up, and you do eventually get stronger, but you just don't want to rush it. And that, and that, again, is what I would tell my 25-year-old self. Let it happen naturally. Frank Zane had a, had a, had a great quote about this, and I'm, I'm not going to quote him word for word. I'm going to paraphrase what he said. He said, I would dumbbell press the 60s, until they were no longer easy. He didn't do the 60s today and say, oh my God, I have to do 62 and a half next week, or I have to do the 65s, then I have to be doing the 70s a month from now. He simply 
got better at doing the 60s, mastered his technique, and got to the point where, okay, the 60s are easy. They're no longer presenting a challenge. Now I'll go to the 65s, and I'll stick with the 65s until they are, um, again, until I've mastered the 65s, and they're no longer challenging. So slow your roll. Check yourself before you wreck yourself when it comes to progression. Naturally, over time, it's going to happen don't rush it, don't chase it, don't push it. Or trust me, a hundred times out of a hundred, you will develop those nagging aches and pains. And a lot of times you will get injured. And worst case scenario, you will end up in the surgeon's office. Been there, done that, work with a million people who have done the same. So not something that I would recommend. Do you advise bulk and cut cycles? So I would say yes, but in a smart way. Meaning, let's say someone starts training and they're skinny and lean. Let's bulk, buddy. You you want to gain muscle, right? That That's your main goal is you want to get jacked. You want to gain muscle. So we're going to focus on eating more calories. And, you know, some people like to say, oh, well, maybe that's 200 over maintenance. So they give a, a strict number. That's 300 over maintenance. It's really hard to give uh, any specific formula. You know, we have start. I have a place where I would start them, and I have an idea but we really just need to see how that person's metabolism is and how they're adapting. And then the goal is for them to eat as much as possible. I don't want to say, hey, here's your maintenance. Let's just have uh, two ounces of liver above that a day. You know, get into that OCD stuff and start worrying about, oh, well, you know, eat as little as possible because that's the best thing for longevity. I think the opposite is true. I think having as much muscle as you can carry without, you know, getting insane and using all kinds of drugs and whatnot. Um, is going to be better for longevity. So, uh, again, I can't give a specific number. I don't know if it's 200 over maintenance. Maybe for someone with a slow metabolism who gets fat easily, yeah, maybe it's 300 over maintenance. Maybe it's 500 over maintenance. Maybe it's 1,000 over maintenance. It depends on so many factors, your age, um, how you're training, how you're sleeping, how you're recovering, all those things. So all we're going to do is push it, right? We'll start with, let's say, a gram of protein per pound of body weight. Carbs would be at least a gram per pound, if not two grams per pound, and we may push it up from there. And then fat will be, let's say, 0.4 times body weight. And some people may blow past these numbers. Some people with a fast metabolism who really are hard gainers and have a hard time gaining muscle, they may end up at, at three times body weight in terms of uh, carbs. And then we may push them up to 0.5 times body weight in terms of fat. Uh, it's just hard to say it's individual. You need to work with somebody, or if you're not working with a coach like myself, you just need to see what's the scale showing. How are my pumps and my strength gains in the gym? How do I feel? How am I recovering? And what is, um, what is my body fat looking like? And even if you're not measuring it, just do a rudimentary measure each night when you take off your shirt and look at yourself. If you're smoothing out every single week, well, now you got to dial things back a little. You might have to cut some, some of your fat. You might have to cut some of your carbs. Uh, some, something, some kind of calories have to be reduced. So, and, and so that's how it would bulk, right? And then ideally we're not going to get fat. Uh, so opposite case so I, I gave a hypothetical there of someone who is a skinny ripped guy that's traditionally actually not a hard gainer because it's easy for that guy to gain weight than it is for the true hard gainer which is someone who's skinny fat right he's got like those bird tits he's got a little tire but his arms are like string beans his legs are like string beans he has no de muscular development that guy's got it really hard so for that guy, we're going to have to have a really small uh, surplus, and we're going to have to be really careful about the ratio of carbs, fats, things like that. And then uh, that guy can't afford to gain too much fat because for every pound of muscle that guy gains, he's going to gain two, maybe three pounds of fat. So he's got to take it really slow. That's the curse of the hard gainer. That's why I wrote I, – I get it because that is me. I am the ultimate hard gainer. Um, I'm skinny fat. I was fat, then I was skinny fat. I have, you know, tiny joints. My my wife's wrists are bigger than mine. Uh, I get injured more than Allen Iverson and Grant Hill combined. I used to get sick when the wind blows. That's another thing is a weak immune system. All these things contribute to be to you being a true hard gainer. And in that case, we really gotta, you know, be be smart about how much of a surplus and how much fat we allow you to gain. So that's a little bit trickier. Uh, just don't let yourself go above 15%. And if, if 
the, the, the most challenging thing is when you have that skinny fat guy who weighs 137 pounds, but he's 18, 20% body fat. It's like, you know, do we get that guy ripped first and now he weighs 120 and he blows away when there's a strong breeze? That's not always great either. So in that case, we are going to do more of a, um, you know, we're going to try to lose fat and gain muscle simultaneously. Now, the nice thing is if he just started training, we can do that. So we can just do more of a body recomp. If you have someone who is just fat, then they want to get lean. First, obviously, we get them down under 15. Ideally, we get that person down to about 12 and then we slowly uh, bulk, but we always want to stay in that fifteen percent range. So if we if we get, if we get a little over that, we're cutting down. But again, it's not old school bulk, bulking, right? Like it's very rare that I would take someone and say, "Hey, just get up and have five egg McMuffins and a gallon of milk and donuts." We're gonna say, "Let's eat as much meat, chicken, fish, eggs, rice, potatoes, sweet potatoes, fruit." as possible. Maybe we add some extra olive oil, add some extra butter for fats, uh, add some, some, some dairy, some, some Greek yogurt, some things like that. And now if that person's shoveling down the food and still not getting anywhere, what I might do then is switch from, let's say, 93 or 95% lean meat to 90% lean meat. Maybe from fat-free dairy to 1% or 2% or even full-fat dairy. Uh, you know, just from eating 300 grams of carbs to eating 400 grams of carbs, things like that. Those are the changes that I would make. Uh, what is the biggest thing related to health and fitness that you've changed your mind on over the years? I would say two, and I already covered it. One, that everyone just has to do the big power lifts. I don't believe that anymore. I believe there are different exercises that work differently for different people. Uh, I used to say rage against the machines. Everyone should just do free weight and dumbbells, barbells, body weight exercises, and machines were the devil, and we, and we said rage against the machines. I don't believe that anymore. I believe that if you go into any professional weight room of any sport, there are a ton of machines, tons and tons, rows and rows and rows of machines. You go into any good po- uh, powerlifting gym, there are tons and tons and tons of machines. I was being a purist, an old school guy, and even when I used to say that, we had cables, uh, if I'd go on the road somewhere, I would use machines. It was almost more of a gimmick. Where And now I know enough to say that, hey, for certain people on certain exercises or certain movement patterns, a machine is going to be your best choice there. It's going to be your best choice of exercise there. It's going to cause you the least amount of pain. Here's the other thing a lot of people don't know about machines either. It's actually less fatiguing to use a machine. So a squat on a hack squat machine or a pendulum is less fatiguing than a free weight squat. So again, if we want to minimize fatigue and always feel good, sometimes the machine's a better option there just for minimizing that central fatigue. Also, it's easier to take your sets closer to failure. And so taking sets close to failure, not necessarily to failure, is much safer and easier on a machine. It's much less fatiguing. And if you want to go all the way to failure, absolutely a hack or a pendulum is going to be much safer than doing it with a free weight barbell squat. I would never recommend taking a free weight barbell squat or deadlift or quite frankly even a bench press or overhead press to failure. But on a machine version of any of those, you can take them safely to failure. So I think that would be the main thing is exercise selection, you know, free weights versus machines. The next thing would be, you know, we we used to call it uh, CNS fatigue. Now, you know, the, the, the official term, the correct terms is, is central fatigue, which, you know, we don't have to geek out on the science and get into all that, but we used to have this belief and everyone said this, and I said it a million times back in the nineties and early two thousands that low reps, one to five reps was more fatiguing than higher reps. Now we have enough study and even real world evidence from people to know that the opposite is actually true doing the lower rep sets. And if you if you there's no reason for most average people to be doing those one to four rep sets, but five to eight is a great rep range. And I've said this, if you go back through my work for 20 years now, I've said I really like that five to eight rep range for the majority of people, the majority of time. Uh, I think it's great. But there was a time where we all thought that the higher reps cause more, uh, I'm sorry, cause less of that CNS fatigue. Now we know that to be the opposite. But the funny thing is for me, when I look back at, 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 at my education and, and so much of it came from the legends of the Iron Game, guys like Arthur Saxon and George Hackenschmidt and, and Steve Reeves, they all uh, 
always Anthony Dottillo, you know, from the 1900s till the 1960s. All of those guys talked all the time about the benefits of doing lower rep training. And they actually said higher rep training burns you out, causes fatigue, uh, is unnecessary, should be avoided. And the funny thing is now, 100 plus years later, the science is showing that to be true. But those guys knew that way back then. So I learned that not from the science. I learned that from the pioneers way back in the 90s. And I always found that to be true. Again, there's always an exception. There's cave- there's caveats to, to rules like that where if you have an injury, you just can't go low rep on stuff, right? Maybe certain exercises just don't feel good for low reps. But for the most part, that's you know that's going to be um, something that I changed my mind on. And, and I have a couple quotes here from Vince Gironda. He is known as the Iron Guru. He uh, taught me and many others a lot of things. He said, due to the uh, nervous emotional makeup of the underweight hard gainer, I never recommend more than six to eight reps. Larry Scott, who was Vince Gironda's pupil and also the first Mr. Olympia, I believe in 1959, said, the best programs for building size are those utilizing approximately six to eight reps. So there we have it. You know, we have the science now, but we knew this, and those guys knew it from experience years and years and years, decades before we needed, you know, all these meta-analyses and studies to prove this to us. That's why I've said multiple times, and I'll continue to say, I will always look to someone who has years of experience before I will look to someone who is just a book nerd, a scientist who's just quoting the latest study, because oftentimes the person who's quoting the latest study doesn't have the experience, they don't know how to interpret it, they don't know how it applies in the real world, and they may and probably will a week or two or a month or two or a year or two later say the exact opposite of what they just said today, because new studies proved what they thought was true to be untrue. So always look at experience over studies. Studies really don't prove anything. They just show us why what we figured out in the trenches and through world experience, real world experience works or doesn't work. That's my view on studies. Guys, I think that's it. Let, let's wrap it up there for today. I, uh, I appreciate you all so much for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, what I do is once a week on my Instagram, I post on my stories. I ask you guys for questions. Send them my way. It could be anything about training, fitness, diet, recovery, mindset, confidence building, uh, any of the things that I've worked with, the things uh, that I've worked on, the things that I've struggled with to improve. Those are the things I like to talk about. And so if you have questions, keep them coming. Thank you so much for watching, for listening, for sharing the show. If you could comment anywhere you're watching or listening to this, if you could leave a comment, that'd be great. If you could leave a review on iTunes, that'd be amazing. Even if you don't have time to type up a few lines, if you could leave a five-star review, that'd be great. And I appreciate you all so much uh, for listening, for watching, for sharing. Love you guys. I'm Audi 5000. Peace.